Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode number 301 of Should I Start a Podcast. Today, we're talking about how to launch a podcast brand. Well, actually, if you listen to this episode all the way to the end, you will know that this is not only about launching a podcast brand, but you can take the tips and ideas and tricks that we talk about in this episode to launch pretty much anything, whether it is a book, a product, a podcast, a brand, you can use the ideas in this episode to do all that. You will learn how America's Angriest Trainer launched his podcast and understand how you have to rebrand and refresh your brand every, ever so often. Learn to think about how to present an elegant looking brand and take a deeper look at brand consistency and why it is crucial to have brand guidelines. We answer a question about how a barbecue restaurant became a media brand and we rethink your podcast hosting responsibilities by having a clear vision about how you show up for your audience as a host and how you connect with them. Understand how to launch a brand once you have the branding basics sorted, but we'll talk about all this and more in this episode of Should I Start a Podcast. And make sure you listen all the way to the end. I'll break down this episode to give you three small steps you can execute right now to help you take this listening experience into an execution experience. Also, if you know a business owner that needs to hear an episode about why a podcast is the best business development tool, please share this episode or any other one with them. Pretty please. Enjoy the show. Indicator one, this is launch control. Please advise when pre-flight checklist is complete. With indicator one to control, pre-flight is complete. All indicators read green. This is Should I Start a Podcast? A show for business owners looking for tips, tricks, and ingenious hacks when it comes to growing a business using their podcast. This is your host, Ronsley. He's interviewed more than 1,400 people and has been listened to over 5 million times in 133 countries. A TED speaker, author, and a podcast purist who believes that we can use our voices to grow our business and our influence. You know, because every conversion in any business always happens in a conversation. And now, Ronsley. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We are joined by our usual crew of James, Sandy, Sean, Anna. Team, I wanted to talk today about launching a brand. And I'm sure Sean has a lot of stuff to say. I'm sure that everyone here has a lot of stuff to say. But let me give context for launching a brand. When I talk about launching a brand, I'm talking about when someone is starting off and they're first launching their first podcast and they don't have anything else in their ecosystem, that is them launching their brand. And then once they have a podcast, maybe they have a product and they want to put that product out. And that's them relaunching their brand with a new part of their ecosystem. Then they start getting a lead magnet. Then they relaunch again. Then they maybe write a book and they relaunch again. Then they maybe get a new website and they relaunch again. And I believe that for a brand, we got to launch and relaunch multiple times. So I would sort of maybe open it up to the panel here. And is that statement true or is it false? And if you disagree or agree with me, what are your thoughts? Do we launch and relaunch our brands every time we put new stuff out? I'll start. Yeah. I mean, listen, if you're just launching a podcast, like when Vinny and I launched his podcast in 2012, by the way, it was called America's Angriest Trainer. And the reason why he called it that was because he was angry at the health and fitness industry for stealing people's good intentions. It wasn't that he was an angry guy and was going to make you like lift extra weights or like how they do on The Biggest Loser. They go like scream at you to push a tire up a hill, even though you're about to faint. And he was America's Angriest Trainer with co-host Anna Pacino. And we didn't quite have a brand. And he had a book out called Fitness Confidential. And I was currently blogging gluten-free called Gluten-Free Anna. And it was all kind of a big mess. And that's okay. Like I think that once we started to dial it in, like America's Angriest Trainer was it for several years until he, he rebranded his podcast, Fitness Confidential, to match the title of the book, which made more sense. But really, we were building ourselves as brands. And so everything that we've come up with, and for me, writing the two cookbooks called Eat Happy and then launching the food brand, Eat Happy Kitchen, yes, you're constantly rebranding and figuring it out. And you may have to do a complete refresh. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I, I don't know if anybody <laughs> look at Facebook. <laughs> Everybody has to rebrand at some point. But I don't think there's anything wrong with refreshing. I think you want to definitely be aware of when you're kind of all over the place. I feel like some folks don't necessarily have an instinct for that. Or when you realize that you are all over the place, you need to do it, get to that rebranding as soon as possible. And 
if you can hire a professional set of eyeballs to help you do that with as, as far as graphic design goes. And if you can hire a branding firm, even better. I've never been able to afford that, so I don't know. But you're right. We are constantly refreshing our brand as we launch new things. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with a freshen up. It's like getting a facelift. There's nothing wrong with a facelift, is there? I don't think so. And Anna, look at Facebook. I mean, just they're doing a rebrand, one of the biggest companies in the world. It's massive what they have done. And I agree with everything that Anna said. It's funny, Facebook actually, or Meta, as it likes to be called now, just copped a a lot of heat about their logo. (laughs) It's not the fanciest logo that you could possibly have. But from my perspective, I think it's important to have something as far as brand, because it is a way of credibility and authority. And since I like bringing in a quote and every single time we have these clubhouse rooms, make sure the outside of you is a good reflection of the inside of you. And that's what I think about in terms of brand is making sure that the brand that encapsulates you and everything else you do, making sure it's something clean, making sure it's something professional is great. And then making sure that's consistent. So that's sort of the big one, two for me is first making sure you have that elegant looking brand that works really well for the transformation that you want to create for people and captures that emotion of what you want to have with a group of people you're passionate about helping. And second, making sure that is consistent. I find it really frustrating when someone's got a really crappy brand that they could have spent a dollar and 20 minutes optimizing and they have something really bad and then they've just got no consistency around anything they do. I mean, it's 2021. These are things that are so easy to do. It's really picking the low-hanging fruit to be able to go and do that. So you've got to make sure you do that. I feel that Sean might have something to say. I'd like to bring it to branding basics first is because say we have all that sorted, say we have it clean, we have it consistent, we've maybe spent money and it's not that much, Anna, these days to spend money with a branding firm to get like all your designs done and all your brand guidelines done. But what I'd love to do just before we get into the topic of launching the brand is what are the brand basics? I mean, James mentions clean, consistent. We spoke about launching, relaunching, and it's okay having it in different spaces. Any branding basics that we'd like to get out of the way? <laughs> Ron's Leah, love the room always, but we're a barbecue brand and we didn't start as a barbecue brand. We are a barbecue media brand. We didn't start as a barbecue media brand. When I first opened our business in 2008, the name of our company was California Comfort Restaurant and Sports Bar. And that was my aha moment of that is way too long of a word, too many words to go and try to market online. It was too hard to tell a radio host to do a commercial read. It was too difficult to get signage. So our brand has evolved over 13 years to what it is now. But Ronsley, I love the idea that you brought forward is, yes, we have always been changing, even though we've been consistent throughout. So when we decided to go from California Comfort Restaurant Sports Bar to Cali Comfort, we were consistent and concise. So that was our story. We are Cali Comfort. Once we became a barbecue brand, we became Cali Comfort Barbecue. Once we got to where we are now, we got rid of the comfort and we became Cali Barbecue. Once we added the media component, we became Cali Barbecue Media. So it's a long way of saying that what you are today, you don't have to be next year. You don't have to be the following year. But what you do have to be is evolving and consistent. I love the fact that James brought up consistency. Consistency and are you concise? Because if you're concise, it's what do people remember you for? The reason why I always introduce myself as Sean from Cali Barbecue Media is because it makes you think I've never heard of somebody that owns a barbecue business talk about media. But ultimately, it's not about me. It's about all what people think of me. It's why does Ronsley invite me into the room? Why does James care what I have to say? Obviously, I have to add value. So that's kind of how I think about the brand conversation. I want to extend that too like on point perfect. Another way to look at it as well, there's almost like two brands going alongside each other when you are a podcast host. So it's the brand of the mission. Like, why do you have this podcast? Is it to reinforce your business? Is it to change the world in some way? That's one thing. But it also then you have to look at who you are as an individual and your individual brand. Who are you going to show up? And that as well needs to be consistent as you refresh, as you quote unquote rebrand or evolve, you have to have a clear vision of what that point of view is, how you want to show up to your audience. So when they are in their everyday life and they think of you or your brand, 
the normal tasks that they do every day, you come to mind because you have such a strong brand as a person and you connect with your audience on that level as well. So it's like your business brand and then you as an individual. I think part of the branding as well, to your point, Sandy and Sean, is it's not only about the colors, logos, and fonts. It's about the messaging. It's about the taglines, about the consistency of transformation. For example, if you're a company that's known for helping people sleep, then making sure that everyone knows that that's what you're kind of known for. We want to be sure that we're known for the coaching company that helps businesses that have a podcast to grow their business. So everything we do needs to be in consistent line with that. So say, for example, we have all that stuff. We have the clean, we have the consistent. Say we've spent money getting it all together. It all looks great. We have our colors, logos, and fonts. We have our messaging, hopefully, sorted in the sense that how we want our people to feel when they come across our content, how we we want them to feel while they're consuming our content and how we want them to feel after they've kind of gone through the transformation we deliver. And we have all that in place. How would we go around launching a brand? I mean, that's 80% of the work, right? So we have everything in place. We have a new website. We've redone our podcast. We've got a new book. How do we go about launching that? Well, I think there needs to be figuring out how you want to start delivering some type of transformation and also getting clear on who it is that you help. That's where things like having a podcast or having a book or a YouTube channel, whatever it is, making sure that you have some way of providing regular value on a consistent basis and also adding in your credibility stack to date. It doesn't need to be anything too crazy, especially if you're just starting out, but perhaps there's some case studies from people you've been able to help for a low cost or maybe even for free in exchange for a testimonial and to feature them as a case study. Maybe you've been featured somewhere in a magazine or a a website, all of those different opportunities. So having some avenue for delivering that transformation and then having your credibility stack in there, I think you're going to make it a lot easier for you to be able to build your business that leverages that brand. And if you don't have those things, people need to be able to see themselves in someone else's journey at the start of that. You can't just be featuring hero stories of people with Lamborghinis or whatever the equivalent is in in your industry. You need to go back and look at the before photos and the before stories of those people to build that into your brand so people trust you with meeting them where they are and then taking them on their hero's journey. When you have everything ready to go and you're ready to launch, I mean, the most important thing is getting some earballs and some eyeballs on it. Everything that James said, any sort of social proof that you can get. And then I would also reach out to friends and family. That's basically how Vinny and I launched. We were like, internet, (laughs) we're doing this thing. And I just made sure that we had banked seven to 10 episodes. And I kind of got friends and family on board really quickly We all have friends and family who are kind of like the mavens and the menches of the world who will start to spread the word. And it took us a hot second to get our voices down, exactly what we wanted to do. It takes a second to get some traction. I did already have a little bit of a social media presence back when we launched, but it took some time to build stuff up and you want stuff to build organically and people to come in. And obviously things have changed now and things are a lot more fractured, but I would say whatever assets you can create across your social medias that are the most active and have the most people, If you already have an established podcast and you're refreshing, or you have an established podcast and you're launching your book, you obviously already have a target audience of people that you're addressing. And then you may have to do some extra things. You may have to really hustle and get some guest spots on other podcasts or hustle and get some blog coverage and that kind of stuff. And and you may have to hire a third party. I hired a book publicist when I came out with my second book, and it was very helpful getting into different segments. I didn't know what a blog tour was and I still don't really know what it is, but damn if they didn't have a hundred different blogs covering my book the week that it launched. So there was lots of search terms coming up and, and lots of word of mouth and lots of mommy bloggers writing about the new cookbook that was coming out. So that kind of a thing, I'm a huge fan of paying for outside help when you can afford it, when it's available to you, as long as it's an intelligent use of that, because We've all hemorrhaged money on stuff we shouldn't have, and those are expensive learning experiences, but you never forget the lesson, that's for sure. I love all of that. The multiple blog posts like that and and maybe paying to put that in motion because that 
cross pollinates you across so many different communities. But in terms of launching, I think it sort of depends of where you're at. Are you launching a new podcast? Are you launching a new business? Are you launching a book? Are you relaunching a podcast? I think you might be at a lot of different stages, but I think a lot of core practices can work in all of those scenarios. And I think hype and around something launching can be really fun. Like people do like to be a part of something. It's kind of like, oh, this great concert or this show is releasing in the theaters on November 15th and you see like a zillion trailers before it comes out. So I think you have to either be your own hype manager or you need to find a few people that will be brand ambassadors for you, people who've written testimonials before, which is your social proof, obviously. But if you could get them along for the ride and you can post a little video testimonial on LinkedIn and you can do some sort of contest to get people to show up or a giveaway on Instagram, like do it across all different channels and If you have customers that you've already worked with for your company or people who did the beta testing for you that didn't have to pay a penny, but you get them to be part of your launch team, I think you have to try and do as much as you can. But people launching books do it too. And I'm sure you can attest to this, that before it was actually available to print and ship, or you could pre-order it on Amazon and that type of thing. So I think that the game before the game, the actual game is really critical and starts to get your brand out there and your images and your likeness and your voice and all of that. If you are launching a book or any sort of product on Amazon and you're you're wanting to pre-sell or have a big launch about it, definitely be up to speed on whatever Amazon's policies and algorithms are doing. Because if there's been an algorithm change, for example, When I launched my first book in 2016, you're supposed to pre-sell, right? And then on the day it goes, it charges everybody's credit card. So no one's credit card is charged when they're pre-ordering your book. And then the day that the book drops, they charge everybody's credit cards and then jacks your rating up in the Amazon ratings. And if you've chosen the correct categories, hopefully you'll get to like number one or bestseller status in one of those categories in the top 100 of Amazon or something like that. So by the time I launched my second book, it didn't even cross my mind that I should find out what Amazon's algorithm is doing. I just assumed that that's what we did. And as you know, the phrase, what happens when you assume? So I found out from Amazon because I thought that's really interesting because even though they're still not charging people's credit cards until the day that it actually drops and they can actually charge the card and fulfill the order, they were counting all of my pre-sales at the time they were happening as far as the algorithm for bestseller status. And I would have not pre-sold. I would have waited until the day the book dropped and just not had it available and done it all that way. Have everybody kind of buy it in the same first week. That was 2019. They could have changed it since then. They probably have. They're Amazon. They, They change things on a dime. So I would advise to find out, know the shot before you take it. Hey, this is Mick Hawes. I'm a business owner, podcaster, and coach of amazing builders. I'm on the inside of We Are Podcast members, or as we call it, the Whamley. Now, if you're thinking about growing your business using your podcast and your online presence, come and join us on the inside. I'd love to meet you. James and Ronsley coach us to get recurring results in our business. And if you want that roadmap, which we all follow to get those recurring results, you can download it at Roadmap. Dot we are podcast.com. Now back to the show. There's a bunch of different things that you spoke about, which I really want to get deep into. And I spoke about earbuds and eyeballs and getting more of that. Like I love the brand ambassador idea and the blogging idea, but also pre-selling. So let's start with pre-selling because I think that when you're launching a brand, if you can get some pre-sales done in the brand launch, then you can take care of a lot of the brand launching expenses as well. So let's maybe talk about that. I mean, James, you've obviously 
released multiple best-selling books and other stuff. Sandy, you've been on radio for so long. It's crazy. Sean, you've launched and relaunched a brand. Anna, you've got so many books that you've done. Holly, your book and your podcast. So from your perspective, if you were relaunching again, how would you pre-sell and what would you have to have in place to make that happen? Such a great question. Tim Ferriss actually wrote a really amazing blog post on how to make your book like a legit bestseller as far as getting into the hands of as many people as possible. There's obviously the vanity benefits of things by having a bestseller, but the big one for him was finding the most influential people he could find, being very specific on something that they could help him with, which of course was distributing the book out to their and the the pre-launch link out to all of their audiences and then coordinating it all at the one time. And on this clubhouse, we have often spoken about the challenges that people have about a specific ask. But if you're building up your network and your influence, and then you have proven through your social capital that you are always willing to go above and beyond to help those people, that when you do have an opportunity for something that you want to launch, being very specific about what they can do and what you want and making sure that you incentivize them. For an example, maybe there's a an affiliate fee, maybe you could build in a product that rather than it just being a book, maybe it ends up being a $10,000 offer or a $20,000 offer and through the bonuses that you can provide and then you can build in a much larger affiliate for those uh, affiliate commission percentage for those people, those highly influential people who have got very large lists. That's a great way of being able to achieve your goals as far as growing your business, hitting your bestseller status and doing all of those other things. It's a lot more of that abundance philosophy, whereas a lot of the things that I've seen, particularly on the book side, are around finding an obscure category on Amazon, pricing your book as close to free as you can possibly get. So you can call yourself a best-selling author, even though no one has actually got a copy of it. So hopefully that was interesting for some people. Yeah, that pre-sale idea is really interesting. I mean, James, you mentioned that he was giving out this pre-sale link. I think what tends to happen when we're launching anything is that we give people way too many options as to what we want them to do. How would you streamline it if you had to do it again? It's a great question. It's very much the paradox of choice. Like the more decisions you add up for people, the more likely it is to lead to indecision, which means nothing is going to happen. So talking about those influencer partners specifically, they're going to be doing it for one of a few reasons. They're going to be doing it because they're friends with you and will do anything you say, just as you would do it for them when they have a book come out. So that's a great partnership to have. And I think that is the best one. That is the easiest avenue to be able to have one very specific call to action to being able to move it through. Now, if you're trying to do a product for people who you don't know very well, or you're going to need in to build more value where they are remunerated for access to those lists, the only way they're going to be able to do that is by increasing the value of the product. And the way that they would do that is by partnering with you to say, for example, here is some bonus assets that I have, like some type of masterclass or an online course or an event, whatever it is. And that way, when someone clicks on the thing to buy the book, they can click another button that says, hey, would you like to get $100,000 worth of value for only $8,000? And that's where the affiliate would then get potentially 50%, maybe even more of the the revenue from that list. So yeah, that's a way to do it. So they are a few of the things that, that I would think about is knowing the people in your network who you're friends with, who will do anything for you and making it as easy as possible to do a coordinated launch to those audiences. And then people who are just outside that sphere who want some great affiliate revenue and an opportunity to add more value to the audience would be what you can do to bundle in something together. John Lee Dumas, I think, did that pretty well with his recent book. I forget the title specifically. (laughs) Something about a path to success. He had done that pretty well with all the bonuses and things that were, uh, were on offer. It was the common path to uncommon success. He was on my show too. He was really good. Oh, nice. Yeah, we, we ran a whole clubhouse session just for the launch of the book. So I had a big one yesterday at the foot, at the NFL and, uh, and Halloween. So uh, I'm not as sharp as I normally am. The point is, we spoke about pre-sale. And I think there's a really, for everyone listening, whether you're listening here or you're listening to the podcast later, there's a really good book that I recommend called Oversubscribed by Daniel Priestley. And it's a really, really good book on how to pre-sell and how to do it really well. and I think that those are really good 
resources to think about when you're launching anything going forward. I want to ask the question again to the panel here for some ideas on getting earballs, eyeballs on the new stuff, right? On whatever we are launching. What kind of strategies? Maybe we go in order, James and Sandy, then Sean, Anna and Holly. What are some like two or three tips and ideas on how to get more attention to the launch of your new brand or new product or new book or new website? Great question. For me, I think it would be making sure when it comes to attention, you want the right kind of a people. There's no point getting attention from people who aren't really a good fit, don't really have problems you're not passionate about and have no interest in other solutions and things that you might present. So I think finding influential people in a specific niche for you, even if the numbers are smaller, it's a higher probability that those people are a good fit and doing what you can to basically add value you to that audience. That's what I think would be a primary focus from my perspective and and keen to hear what others say. In radio, we are all focused on local. Like the big picture isn't that big of a deal to us, even though we are in the podcast world too. And the more downloads, the more listeners we get, the better. But we are so narrow focused on our local community that we are like now part of the fabric of the community. So for some people, when you're rebranding, depending on what your goal is of your podcast, if it is just to grow your business or whatnot, it might be less daunting or easier just to stay as local as you can to connect with the people in your community that will help promote you because a lot of businesses want to tie in with a podcast and and that's kind of like a cool thing. So if you are known to be whatever your niche is in your community, the go-to person, that's kind of cool too. And then it'll grow from there. But sometimes it might be just easy to start small and look around in your local community, be that go-to person, and then it'll just eventually grow because they'll help promote it. And then it'll get larger. I love that, Sandy. That's a phenomenal advice. And that's something that we've used for our barbecue restaurant as we've grown to a media company. I'm going to share something that I, I learned when I was at the podcast movement conference when it was at Anaheim back when I first started podcasting. I went over there in 2017 and one of the speakers was talking about social media. And she said, there's this platform that a lot of not just podcasters, but just a lot of people ignore and they overlook. And that platform is Twitter. Because Twitter is a platform that legacy media, and by legacy media, I mean radio, magazines, newspapers, and TV, they are all on Twitter. That is a platform that they all live and breathe on. So if you're looking for that extra promotion, um, if you're looking to develop relationships with people that are reporters, that are writers, that produce the news to help launch your product or service, it's a great place to start to learn the ecosystem and Back to what Sandy said, learn the ecosystem locally. So what we started doing for five years, operating a restaurant, getting ignored by local media, no one cared from the newspaper, no one cared from magazines, no one cared from the the big blogs, no one cared from TV. We ultimately started telling our own story using social media, but we also started strategically using Twitter in a space that for us, it wasn't the food space necessarily, it was the sports entertainment space. So with the San Diego Chargers, with the San Diego Padres, the San Diego State Aztecs, we developed relationships with a lot of the sports media in town. And with any big event, there's always a hospitality food element. And we were able to garnish a lot of opportunities that we wouldn't have otherwise. And more importantly, we learned how to play the game within the game. So we started learning how the whole radio works. We started learning how the newspaper worked. We started learning how local news worked and we developed relationships. So anytime we got an opportunity to go feed the local radio station or the news, we treated it like it was our Super Bowl. We brought our A game, we brought everything and we made memorable moments for not just the anchor, not just the radio host, but the engineers, the people that were in lighting. And by doing that, we built this ecosystem where now we have all this opportunity that comes in a reverse funnel. So we put out content on social and we get all these opportunities to go and share our story and launch our story in ways that we never would have had we not gone through that experience. Oh my gosh, you guys' answers are so good. I was going to say video. And if you have at all a way to film video, 
I just feel like filming video right now is a great way to connect and really state your case about making your launch. Do it in funny ways. Do it in your way. Do it with your voice, your authentic way. Any videos where you can employ your super fans to help and tell them specifically what you need from them. Hey, the day the book comes out, can you guys go grab the thing? Hey, the day the podcast comes out, make sure you go subscribe. I'm going to send you guys a free PDF or whatever. Like shooting video and just looking straight into that camera and really connecting with the people that you're asked for the crucial help with this launch, it goes a really long way. And then of course, general video. I always think a a video on a landing page on a website is always good of like, hey, welcome to my site and here's this, that and the other thing. And I want you to click here and, and I'm looking forward to connecting with you. I always think video is a great way to connect and bring yourself to life and let them see you if you're willing to do that. Just on that, Anna, so there's a very good friend of mine, Dr. Steve Sedell, who had a a product called the Neck Hammock, which some of you might have heard of, and they did really well. They ended up with more than $20 million in sales, raised more than a million dollars in Kickstarter. They absolutely crushed it. And they did a the most budget video you could possibly imagine. And then they did an expensive production video afterwards. And it didn't convert anywhere near as much as the, the cheap one did. So for people out there who are uncomfortable with video or don't have the budget for it, know that there are ways for you to really stand out. Sometimes you can actually get more empathy and, and engagement through a video that's just done using a mobile phone. You don't need necessarily a full production crew to be able to stand out. Yes. Anybody who has a cell phone, which we're all talking on right now, can set up the camera and have the ring light and you can talk for three minutes and cut it down to one minute. You can do jump cuts. You'd be surprised at how much you can just cut together yourself and just talk straight to camera and talk straight to the person. Just try it. Trust me. I wanted to just point out, I think we do have to get crafty sometimes. And I think anything you could do that does not cost you any money to start is always worth trying because free is a really nice number. And a lot of times when we're starting out, we don't really have a budget. So yeah, it would be really nice to hire people to do video and it would be really nice to hire publicists and different people to move us forward, but we got to take chances and figure it out. So I think we sometimes have to go a little outside of our box, like literally saying to myself, well, couldn't the PR agency use almost like a podcast agent? Like, do they have that? I I love when I'm just the person listening and this is just a field of brilliant information and ideas and tips and tricks. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for all your great ideas and being able to give me a whole new list of things to do. Thank you, team. This has been absolutely amazing. James, Sandy, Sean, Anna, Holly, thank you for being here. Thank you, team. All right, you got to the end. Now that you've listened to this packed full of information, I want you to do three small steps that will help you launch your next thing. First, make a list of where you want to be seen. Where do you want to be known? And what are those platforms? What do those platforms look like? And to whom? Who is your audience that will you want that attention on from those platforms? Write that down. Number two, Now that you're kind of thinking about who your target market is, think about who has your target market and has no competitive overlap. Who does different things to what you do for the same audience? Make a list of these people. If you've listened to previous episodes of the show, you would already have this list done. So hopefully you already have a list of people that have your target market and no competitive overlap. Number three, Create a 13-week timeline before you're about to launch something. This could be hypothetical. Just do this right now. So you always have a 13-week timeline before you're about to launch. What does that look like in 13 weeks? What would you like to happen? How would you like it to go down? And who would you like helping you? Pick your strategies well. And if you pick the right strategy, you will get massive, massive results. If this is the first podcast episode you're listening to all the way to the end, or if you are a regular, I thank you, thank you so much. I love that you're here. Check out our back catalog on shouldistartapodcast.com. Subscribe to the show, please, and give me a review and rating. It really, really helps me get found. If you're a business owner, podcaster, and want to join others just like you in a group where we share tactics and ideas on what's working, for us, when it comes to using our podcast in the best possible way, go to wearepodcast.com slash group. It is free. And 
We Are Podcast 2022 is happening this year in Brisbane. We have the venue, we've booked the venue, we have the first speakers for all the latest announcements on Australia's first podcasting conference for business owners. Join the group, wearepodcast.com slash group. Stay tuned next week where we are going to talk with the legend that is John Lee Dumas. We're going to cover lots, including the common path to uncommon success. So don't forget to subscribe to the show to get that episode as soon as it gets released. Until then, much love. <laughs> All right. So you still till the end. Uh, you found this useful and you have a business and or you have a podcast and a business and you kind of want to make it work for you and grow your business using this podcast. Well, you know what? That's something that I have helped thousands of people do and thousands of businesses do in different forms uh, through an agency in a one-on-one -on -one fashion, through a, a conference, in a, a group and obviously in courses and stuff. So please, I want to be able to give you something that you can use to get recurring results in your business using a podcast. We call it the Recurring Results Roadmap. It is years of putting this in practice. It is the blueprint uh, to get results and recurring results using your podcast. If you'd like that, send me a message, ronsley at gmail.com. I want to hear from you. I want to hear your voice or uh, want to hear from you. So if you've listened to this and you want that roadmap, please send me an email, ronsley at gmail.com. Uh, I want to hear from you. Much love. I'll see you in the next episode.